What's up, Taiwan? I'm Eric Gao, bringing you the news from here in Taipei. The search is on for survivors of the strongest earthquake to hit Taiwan in 25 years. The magnitude 7.2 quake that rocked the country on Wednesday morning has left at least nine people dead and over a thousand others injured. Rescue teams are focusing on Hualien in the country's east, where dozens of buildings have collapsed and roads and tunnels have been destroyed. Rick Lauer joins us live from Hualien City. Rick, tremors have continued throughout the night. Are those still going on? Well, there's been three fairly big tremors in the last hour. We had been having a, a relatively quiet morning here in the city of Hualien. After a very bumpy night, there's been about 300 aftershocks after the main earthquake. That's, of course, going to affect the ongoing rescue operations and, and the clearance operations going on in the city here. I've been talking to people, residents of the city here, about how they are facing the crisis. Take a look at this. 81-year-old Wang Chou Shajun is registering to stay at this emergency shelter at a school in Hualien City in eastern Taiwan. The morning after a deadly quake shook the area. She was unable to sleep alone at home as large aftershocks continued here throughout the night. It's a long holiday weekend and Wang had been planning to spend it with her family on the other side of the country. <laughs> Wang is just one of the many people in this port city of 100,000 forced to leave their homes. After a 7.2 magnitude quake hit just kilometres from here, damaging buildings and wiping out power. Everyone in this city is now accounted for. Search and rescue operations have been wound down and work has begun to demolish and clear damaged buildings. But it will be a while before this community, sandwiched between Taiwan's central mountain range and the Pacific Ocean, is fully reconnected to the rest of the country. People here rely on just two main roads and a railway line to connect Hualien to cities further north, like the capital, Taipei. But these vital arteries were severed by landslides and collapsed tunnels. And it was on these mountain roads where most of the earthquake fatalities occurred. Emergency workers toiled through the night to find those still missing. Clearing debris and reopening the roads could take days or even weeks. In the meantime, extra flights and a special ferry service have been put on. Across Taiwan, it's the start of the tomb sweeping weekend, a festival where families gather together to tend to their ancestors' graves and remember loved ones that came before them. For many here in Hualien, those plans have been dashed, and instead, they're forced to contemplate an uncertain future. So while efforts here in the city are focused on demolishing damaged buildings and clearing up the rubble, there's still rescue operations ongoing outside of the city in the hills around Hualien. There were 50 people trapped as they travelled to a resort in the, in the centre of Taroko Gorge. There was also six miners in another location that have been airlifted to safety. And it is in these mountainous areas where most of the deaths in this earthquake, the largest earthquake to hit Taiwan in 25 years, have occurred. That's hikers hiking in the mountains and drivers driving along the mountain roads. One person has died where we are in the city of Hualien. She was crushed when she went back into the building to rescue her cat when the earthquake hit. So Rick, you said that transportation has been damaged. Is Hualien still cut off from the rest of the country right now? So let me tell you a little bit about the city of Hualien. It's got 100,000 people living here, and it's, it's a hub for the nearby mining industries as well as a hub for tourism. A lot of people come here on the way to hiking the nearby mountains or enjoying the beaches. But it's always been a relatively hard place to get to. The road from the north, that is where Taipei and other major cities is, hugs the mountain. There's a 2,000-metre two, mountains, hugs the cliff by the sea to get here. And so Hualien relies on this road, another road, and a railway to be linked to the all-important north part of Taiwan. Those were all knocked out, of course, in the earthquake. The rail the railway is now back on schedule, uh, ahead of schedule, and there's been extra flights and a special boat put in place to reconnect the city with the rest of the country. But this earthquake has, of course, affected the whole of Taiwan. The government has earmarked 10 million US dollars for uh, reconstruction. Um, but given the impact of, given the size of this earthquake, the impact ha could have been bigger. And we've heard that Taiwan's all-important chip sector is saying that 
that there will be minimal impact to the global supply chain. Thanks, Rick. That was Rick Lauer, live in Hualien. Now, as Rick mentioned, the massive earthquake caused severe damage across Taiwan, including in areas that were far from the epicenter in Hualien. John Van Trieste looks at how the rest of the country has held up. In the heart of Taipei, not far from City Hall, debris falls from a construction site, shaken loose by Wednesday morning's magnitude 7.2 earthquake. Taipei is more than 100 kilometers from the epicenter of the earthquake in Hualien, but violent shaking damaged several buildings in the city. This cluster of 10 buildings is among the worst hit. The 50 households living here are sheltering at a nearby school, and structural experts are not optimistic about the building's chances of repair. There were similar scenes in neighboring New Taipei, too. 157 people evacuated from this building, which had started to lean. They've been placed in hotels and other temporary accommodation, with the city's mayor promising thorough repairs. And the collapse of a mountain slope exposed the foundations of these buildings. Construction crews are reinforcing them with concrete blocks, but officials think there's a chance at least some of the 500 households in this neighborhood will need to evacuate too. There were also injuries. Rescuers pulled out four people trapped in a collapsed factory, and two workers in Taipei were severely burned when the earthquake tipped over a vat of chemicals. Central Taiwan saw damage too. Rock slides on this mountain road in Taichung trapped 21 and injured others. Firefighters were left to rescue them on foot. And in the city of Yuanlin in Zhanghua County, falling debris from a residential building damaged cars. Aftershocks continue to rock much of the country, meaning the final tally of damage and destruction may continue to climb. Dolphine Chen and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. Firefighters have put out a chemical fire at a university that may have been set off by Wednesday's earthquake. That fire broke out in a fourth-floor laboratory at National Donghua University in Hualien shortly after the earthquake struck at 8 a.m., and then it spread to the second and third floors. It was brought under control in two hours, but took 13 hours total to put out. The university says there were no toxic gas leaks and no one was injured. Investigators are still looking into the cause of the blaze. Now let's get more on the impact the earthquake has had on the country's transportation systems. Tiffany Wong is at Taipei Main Station. Tiffany, how's it looking there? Wednesday's earthquake has caused some interruptions to Taiwan's transit systems, but there are still plenty of people looking to travel by train and um, high-speed rail services uh, here just one day later. That's because it's the start of uh, two important holidays in Taiwan. That's the Qingming Tomb Sweeping Festival and also Children's Day, both important family holidays with many people trying to get back home. Now, the train service to Hualien near the center, uh, epicenter of the earthquake has resumed, um, and they're also trying to add more cars to allow as many people as possible uh, to make it back in time for the holiday. However, the highway from Ilan to Hualien uh, is still blocked, um, and officials are still trying to clear the debris there, um, but it, they said it could take days. Now, there have been hundreds of aftershocks since Wednesday's quake, um, and some people here have told me that uh, they've changed their travel plans, trying to avoid those worst affected areas. Um, but other people have said that they're not too worried about any more travel interruptions and are just looking forward to spending the long weekend ahead. Thanks, Tiffany. That was our reporter Tiffany Wong at Taipei Main Station, giving us a look at the transportation situation after the quake. A top U.S. diplomat has made a rare connection between the AUKUS submarine pact and Taiwan. Speaking at a think tank in Washington, D.C., Deputy Secretary of State Kirk Campbell says that new submarine capabilities would enhance peace and stability in areas such as the Taiwan Strait. Campbell also expressed the importance of working closely with other countries to increase deterrence. China has previously called the AUKUS pact a dangerous arms race. AUKUS is made up of the U.S., the U.K., and Australia, 
None of those countries have pledged to help Taiwan directly in the event of a conflict. Tokyo and Manila are close to an agreement that would see Japanese forces deployed in the Philippines. The Philippines' ambassador to the U.S., Jose Manuel Ramualdez, says the plan would be similar to his country's arrangement with American forces. Ramualdez also says that Manila, Tokyo and Washington are close to striking a deal on joint naval patrols in the South China Sea. The moves are part of efforts to counter China's increasing aggression in that region. More information on this agreement is expected when the leaders of the U.S., Japan and the Philippines meet in Washington later this month. What would happen if China invaded Taiwan? Well, experts from a U.S. think tank in Washington have developed a war game that looks at the most likely possibilities. Taiwan Plus was given exclusive access. Jaime Okun reports in this two-part series. The year is 2026, and China has decided to invade Taiwan. That's the scenario in this war game being run by a think tank in Washington, D.C. For decades, Beijing has threatened to bring Taiwan under its control and hasn't ruled out a full-scale invasion to do so. That's why security officials and analysts use war games like this one to simulate different scenarios and see how a conflict could play out. But when we put this invasion scenario together, our argument was that this was not necessarily going to be the future, but because of the Chinese military buildup and its rhetoric, it was plausible to look at invasion. Mark Kansian is a retired colonel from the U.S. Marine Corps and one of the leads of this project. He says concerns over a possible war in the Taiwan Strait motivated him to develop this war game to provide insight on how to both prevent and prepare for a potential conflict. That there's tremendous interest in Taiwan and a possible U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan. So the opportunity to, to provide an analysis, a war game that could look at this in depth over many iterations, many different scenarios arose, and that's where this uh, project came from. So the United States can use uh, Kadena. Uh, there are three Kadena. boards on the table, one that shows Chinese forces, one with a map of Taiwan, and another with U.S. and Japan forces. The game uses different colored pieces to represent the different militaries and their weapon systems. What you see here uh, is a map of Taiwan, and the green units are the Taiwanese army. This is where they actually are. You can see that most of their combat power is up in the north near the capital. The game is set up to align each military's pieces with its arsenal. And with a move from China, the game begins. Each turn or roll of the dice translates to just over three days of real life conflict. In this demonstration, Mark and his team are playing out the base case scenario, or what they say is most likely to happen. And the simulation makes four assumptions. Number one, China has decided to launch an all-out amphibious invasion. Number two, Taiwan resists vigorously. Number three, the U.S. intervenes immediately. And four, Japan allows the U.S. to operate from bases within its territory. With Team China waiting to make their move, and Team U.S.-Japan-Taiwan standing by to defend, the stage is set for a preview of what hopefully will never turn into reality. Devin Tsai, Eric Tsai, and Jaime Okan for Taiwan Plus. That was part one of our series on war games simulating how China could invade Taiwan. Tune in tomorrow for part two, where we find out if Taiwan could defend itself. And thanks for joining us for What's Up Taiwan. If you want more of our reports, download our app to get them on your mobile device. We leave you with more images of the earthquake relief efforts in Hualien. I'm Eric Gao. Take care of yourselves. I'm Joyce Sen in Kumamoto, Japan, and you're watching Taiwan Plus News, a voice of freedom in Asia.